I'm going to tell you a little story today. And this is a little story that has become near and dear to my heart. I mean, it is about identity. Now, I know we all learn about identity, right? We all learn about identity over time. And in middle school, I can, I can definitely connect to when that question, who am I, really started to transform. But recently, it has become a bigger deal because, like, my wife and I are figuring out this whole family thing, right? And when you have, like, two women, it's a little bit more manufactured than typical, and because my wife is carrying, I have to kind of choose, I have to kind of like go to the DNA mall and find someone who represents me. And I'm like, that's a complex question. Like, who am I? Right? Who am I? And so like this whole question about like, who am I and who do I want to be represented in this like future child? It's like, that's a big question, people. Right? So I'm sitting here thinking about this word identity and at the same time, at the same time, I'm trying to write this second book, which is about IEPs, as you all know, and how I just really want to like go with all of them and, and make them a little bit more useful. And so I'm learning about, I'm learning a lot about identity right now and reading a lot about identity and, and I'm realizing a couple of things that I didn't realize. And I'm going to kind of take you back to a story that um, I didn't understand until I realized what I was learning about identity, okay? So before I tell you the story though, I have to do a little bit of baked potato with you. We gotta get on the same page in terms of like, what is this word identity and where does it come from? And so how I've understood the, the, the concept of identity is I see it as a, this, this lovely collection of things that I like to refer to when I work with kids is about like dimensions, you know, what are the dimensions of our kids? And this comes from a metaphor that really helped me understand how to plan inclusively. And if you've seen it, it's a five minute video and it's the airplane metaphor of this idea of rather than designing individual airplanes for every single pilot, what if we design one adjustable plane for all pilots? But if we're going to do that, we need to know what those dimensions of the pilots are. And so if you think about what they had to kind of capture in these pilots to figure out how am I going to design this airplane, they had to choose which dimensions were meaningful. But then I really realized something is that if you look at all these things, height, weight, length, shoe size, all of these things, hips, all, all these parts of our bodies, you realize that you can't change anyone else's, right? I mean, like, I can decide to choose maybe my waist size, but no one can force me to change any of my dimensions, and a lot of them are not changeable. I can't change the size of my feet, right? And the other thing, though, is that when we collect these dimensions, right, of humans, we never we never look for what they're not, right? Like, when someone asks me how tall I am, I never say, well, I'm not six feet, right? Like you can't, it's not, it's not deficit based. It's like, this is just who I am. I'm five eight. Take it or leave it. I can't change that about myself. And so what that does is it forces the airplane manufacturers, they have to make the plane responsive to the pilots because you can't change, you can't change someone else's dimensions, right? And so as I'm thinking about this, okay, I'm thinking, okay, okay, well, could this same principle be applied to curriculum, right? And this is the metaphor that really helped me, okay? So what if we take this idea and rather than having an airplane that's adjustable, we think about a curriculum. So rather than designing individual plans, yeah, totally, Michelle, rather than designing individual plans for every single student, why don't we design one adjustable plan for all students? And so this has been, kind of how I see inclusive design and inclusive frameworks for curriculum. But then I'm thinking to myself, what dimensions do I need to capture in my students so that I can design a plane that responds to them? But thinking about these dimensions in a way that I can't change these dimensions. And this is what I've learned from Leighton in my life. Like he's taught me what dimensions of kids are, like what we need to collect, especially in middle school when kids are just starting to figure these out, right? Is interest, we have strengths, stretches, goals, needs, and then we have this word identities, which I look at this and I'm like, yeah, no, who are we? This is who we are. And some of these things we can change, no, some of these things individuals can change, but these things we can't, we can't change these in others, right? You can't, you can't change this. All we can do is capture them and respond to them. And so then it brings up this question, 
Well, if you can't change someone's dimensions physically, we also, we have to respond to physical dimensions. How do we respond to educational and human dimensions, right? But then this word identity keeps popping out because I'm like, oh, well, that's just who we are. Like, I'm Danish, no problem. And then I realize, and this is a big one, this is where the story comes, okay? Is that you realize that you can have conversations about kids, about like what they're good at and what their interests are, but it kind of hit me. I'm like, you can't tell someone who they are. I mean, you can think it, but I mean, you can't go up to a kid and be like, hi, I think you're gay. It's not going to go over well, right? And so this idea of how do we, how do we kind of capture identity in kids knowing that we can't tell them who they are but the only way we can capture it is for them to self-identify. And so this question that I'm really playing with right now, Heather, <laughs> this thing that I'm playing with right now is how do we create these spaces in our classrooms and our schools and communities that create space for kids to identify in safe ways, okay? And I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. So now I'm gonna take you to the story because I didn't understand any of this until I started researching this and I went back to, I remember the moment where I was like, so this is something that happened in my first year of teaching and I didn't get it. I didn't get it. This is 2005. What is that? 15 years ago. I didn't get it. I was so confused and I'm going to tell you what happened. I did not get it until this year when I was starting to understand identity. Okay, you ready? So we're going to go back in time to 2005. Ready? This is my first school, Bronx, New York, friends, okay? Up here, this right here, this is my classroom. There's no elevator. There's 202 stairs to get to my classroom. I had the strongest calves. And so this is, right, this is my first school, okay, K to five. I'm working, uh, my first year was a grade four classroom, my second year was a grade fifth classroom. So 2005, fifth grade classroom, I'm in the Bronx. To, to kind of give you an idea of composition, half of my kids are African-American, the other half of my kids are Dominican or Puerto Rican, okay? Like, I am the white kid. Now, before we go further, it's important to clarify that I saved no one in this school. No movies were made, okay? Like, let's just get that out of the way, all right? No books were written. But I can tell you that this school saved me, Bethany. <laughs> you took my punchline. No, like I learned, honestly, my, my two years in this building made, is like, will be the hardest and the best year of my teaching career. Like, like, I can't even tell you the lessons that I learned. There's a movie, How the Bronx Saved Me, moving on. So I'm going to tell you a little story about one of my students. Okay, this is what happened. This is what was so confusing to me, okay? So in the South Bronx, of course, when you're in a school that's struggling, because they are, and everything is kind of compared to standardized test rates, right? Oh, I can see I'm already going to be over time. I'm going to go fast. Okay, so the first thing they do when kids aren't meeting expectations is they take away all of the, they take away all of the electives. All we did all day was reading and writing. That's it. And test prep. And so because they felt bad for us sometimes, sometimes they'd throw us a bone. And so like once a week, we got to choose we, we didn't get to choose. We got access to a cultural activity. That's what they called them. And we were assigned. And so one day a week in the morning, you got to do some activity. Okay. Oh my goodness. What a good question. And so the activity that our class got assigned with was African drumming, which I thought was so cool. Right. And this is like, it was pretty good. Like this was actually someone who's an African drummer, who's actually African American. This wasn't just like a white guy with dreadlocks from the Upper West Side. Okay. Like, so this is as authentic as you can get into the South Bronx. And my kids loved it because it was movement, it was rhythm, it was music, they loved it. I just, we loved it. So on Tuesday mornings, we'd go down for African drumming, everyone's happy. Everyone's happy, no behavior problems. Until one Tuesday morning. Are you ready for this? African drumming teacher is sitting in the classroom. Everyone sits in a circle, we're walking in, and the teacher says to my African-American students, Good morning, my African brothers and sisters. It's so nice to see you today. Now, I think this is beautiful. I think this is a connection of identity that I can't offer, okay? 
So I think this is beautiful. I'm feeling all the warm and fuzzy feels. And then one of my students looks at the drumming teacher. It's important to know that this student is African American. He kicks his drum at the teacher and says, I am not African. I will never be African. And he runs out of the room. And I'm like, what is happening? What is happening? I don't even, like, I'm so fast. So I go out and I'm like, honey, what's going on? Did you eat breakfast today? What's going on? And he's sobbing. He's sobbing, okay? And he says to me, Miss Moore, I'm not African. I'm not a slave. What do I say? There's, there's nothing I can say. There's nothing I can say as a 25 year old straight gay, straight gay, 25 <laughs> year old white gay woman from Canada I'm gonna say to this like 10 year old African American boy. There's nothing I can say. There's nothing I can say. So I'm like, I gave him a hug and I'm like, I see you're having a hard day. Do you, wanna, do you wanna not go to drumming today? He's like, yeah, I'm like, okay, let's go do something fun. And I'm thinking to myself, who can talk to him about this? And I'm like, I know his mom. We have a great relationship. So I call up mom. I'm like, Mrs. Campbell, I have to tell you what happened today. She's like, what? And I explain the whole situation. And then she gets mad at me. She's like, oh, you teachers. <laughs> what do I do? She's like, this happens every year. She's like, I just, I wish you would stop telling my son that he's African. We are not African. We're American. We are not slaves. Now what? Now what do I do? I can't do anything. And so I am sitting here listening to this and I don't get it. I do not understand. I do not understand why my student and his family is not identifying with the African part of their culture. I don't get it. For years, I don't get it, okay? So then I'm doing all this research on DNA for my family and it hits me like a truck, you guys. It hits me like a truck, you ready? I am now gonna show you a picture of what I looked like in my first year of teaching, okay? So this is, I'm actually visiting my mom in Vancouver, but I'm living in New York. This is, I, not many people have seen this photo. So I want you to look at it, you ready? Look at it. I'm in a skirt and wearing a sash. I have a top knot. Who is this person with the low, almost cleavage showing shirt? It hit me like a truck, you guys, because if you were to ask me in 2005 if I was gay, you know what I would have said to you? No, I'm not gay. I'm not gay. Gay? No, no, those are those weird, different people. I'm, I'm not gay. Well, that's not me. That's not me. But in the inside, I knew that I was, but I knew that it wasn't a possibility that I could be gay because my family is all religious. It wasn't possible. It was not a possibility. It's, there's no way, there's no way that I could do that, okay? And so then I'm thinking to myself, what do these two situations have in common? And I'm gonna tell you, is that if you look at people of color, if you look at our queer folks, if you look at, oh, we're not done. What about kids with disabilities? You look up in the news about autism, you know what you see? Kids with autism are violent. I need Teflon to protect me from their teeth. No, 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 no. So we have all these, do you think kids are gonna be like, I have autism when that's all they hear? And then a principal calls me, Shelly, I need your help. This is recently, he's like, we have this opportunity to receive some additional funding for our indigenous students, but here's the catch. The students have to self-identify and they're not. So you think of these four situations. We have people of color, we have queer folks, we have people with disabilities, we have indigenous students. What do those four groups of people have in common? I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you. All four of those groups have been targeted, not just discriminated against, targeted, right? It has not been safe to be any of those things for so long. And it hit me like a truck to be like, I know why, I know why Tyshawn and his mom didn't want to identify as African, because that's, it wasn't safe. People who are African American are targeted to this day by police who are supposed to be supporting us. Kids with, kids with disabilities in this, oh my goodness, we could talk about Jewish people. We could, oh my goodness, the list goes on of people who've been marginalized. And we look and like today in our province right now, 
there are systems in place to discriminate and to look at kids with disabilities as burdens to our classroom. And you think to yourself, it is no wonder that kids are not identifying with these pieces of us that we say, well, you should be proud of these things. It is not safe. It is not safe for families to get psych ed testing because they don't want their kid identified. Because you know what that means? That means that they don't have access to so many things. We don't want kids, oh my goodness, kids who are indigenous aren't self-identifying because like the entire system of education has been constructed to eliminate them. And so I'm hitting this more and more and more and more and more targeted, not just vulnerable, they've been targeted, okay? And then we have, and then this happens, Greta Thunberg comes to town. Now I know she's not the only advocate out there, but this is what she did that was different. She stood up on stage and she said, being autistic is my superpower. And I'm like, hmm, that's a different message than what we're used to right? So can you imagine if kids who have autism, who are scared to say they have autism, right? Because that means that they're more work and are a burden. They see someone like Greta on stage saying, hey, she has autism too. And all of a sudden you start to hear kids say things like this. That's like me. Hey, I think that's like me. And you start to realize, you start to realize that that's what it takes. People have to start seeing themselves in the world because if they don't see themselves, this is what it is. This is what it is. It's not safe. If kids are not identifying, it's be not because they don't know, it's because it's not safe to. It's not safe. I can't even tell you. I got married two years ago. I didn't come out to my family until three months before because it wasn't a possibility for me to come out because gay people are weird and different and scary and I'm not weird or different or scary. So how can I be that person? And then I have to tell you, I have to tell you, I thought back, I'm like, well, why am I so scared? Why am I so scared? So I thought back to my own educational experience, okay? And I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, so why wasn't it safe in school to be gay? And then I thought about, well, who am I learning about in school? <laughs> and I'm like, who, who do we learn about, friends? And then you realize, you know who we learn about? This is who we learn about. We learn about a lot of white, straight, non-disabled, cisgendered men. And so you wanna know whose school is safe for? A lot of white, straight, non-disabled, cisgendered boys. And I remember in grade 11, English 11, I'll never forget it, okay? We read fried green tomatoes. It was so good. We actually made fried green tomatoes. Not once, for one second, did we talk about why Iggy and Ruth were living together at the Whistle Stop Cafe, not once, not even once. And I'm like, what a huge opportunity that would have been if me in grade 11 had read this book, not even realizing that I was gay yet, but for the first time saw someone like Iggy, a positive woman gay role model for the first time been able to say, that's like me. And she's not weird. She's not different. She's not scary. I kind of like her pants. What a huge opportunity that would have been. Like not even realizing in the moment that I was gay, looking back, I remember that as an opportunity that was missed. And oh, you got it right there. And so how do we do this? How do we make school safe for all of our kids? How do we make school safe for kids to identify? They need to see themselves, exactly. They need to, when they're learning, they need to see themselves in that content. They need to see themselves in that curriculum. I don't even care if, like, even if you don't even think you have a gay kid in your class, learning about a positive gay um, character in a book that isn't killed off, do you know how revolutionary that would be to them? They may not even recognize it in the moment, right? But how do we cre cre like, create safety for these groups? We have to show them, Loa. This is it, this is it. This is what this means, is that we have to stop showing these kids curriculum that is not them. It has to be them, it has to be who they are, it has to be in their place. And this has caused me such a huge revelation in, in, in learning and teaching, and it's understanding the difference between teaching to diversity and teaching to identity. Teaching to identity is finding out who they are, but, Teaching to diversity is being able to respond to that identity. And it has created this incredible like opportunity in our classrooms and our communities to be like, 
look at your, look at them. Look at your kids. Who is sitting in front of you? Who are they? And how can we use that as an opportunity to create curriculum and content that represents who they are in that moment? And if I can think of any group of kids that, cap, that need that more than anything, it is those kids in those middle schools in that kind of grade six to nine range. They have no idea who they are and think about the possibilities of them looking around them on the wall in the books they're reading, the movies they're watching to be like, hey, that's like me. Hey, look, that's like me. Even if they don't say it out loud, they will remember, I promise you. I promise you, they will not forget because they will realize that one day. Whew, I got a little bit more heated than I thought. Okay, my friends, here's your job. Because I know there are people sitting out here listening to me right now, and they're thinking about the parts of them that they probably don't feel safe about. And I, I'm going to guarantee it. They're, all of us have this piece of us that are like, she's talking about me. And other, so someone last week said that to me. She's like, Shelly, you are a gay woman on stage talking about your wife. She's like, for the first time, I was able to say that's like me. And so to think you are that to your kids but I want you to also think about your colleagues around you. Are your colleagues feeling safe, right? So here's your question. You can choose, you can choose. There's four options here. The first one is, and this is, if you're safe, feel comfortable, and we wanna connect with each other, right? So what are some of your own identities? Are there parts of you that you don't feel safe declaring with others? Like I bet some people don't even realize that some of our own colleagues don't feel safe talking about parts of their lives, right? When you look at your students in your classroom, schools, and community, what do you see? What are the identities in front of you? Not just in your classroom, but in your community. Like, who are the kids? What are you already doing? Because I know you are. What are you already doing so that your students can start to see themselves in the content? And last but not least, how can we construct conditions and opportunities in our classrooms that help students to help students' identities emerge into what they're learning and how they're doing so they can answer this simple question, who am I? Okay, we're gonna put you into groups. <laughs>